Home Assistant 2022.9 was just released and it has a ton of new features and updates. So let's jump on over and take a look. Not only is Home Assistant 2022.9 released, it's also a birthday party for Home Assistant and new Nabucasa. On September 17, 2013, Paulus made his first commit to the open source project, Home Assistant. And ever since then, people enthusiastic about Home Assistant and home automation have been contributing to this project. Nine years later, Home Assistant is used by 500,000 people and that number continues to grow. In addition to Home Assistant turning nine, Nabucasa also turns four. Nabucasa, if you don't know, is the Home Assistant cloud service. With that, you can connect remotely and seamlessly to Home Assistant. And you can also do things like enable TTS super simply and control all of your devices through smart speakers and whatnot using the Home Assistant Nabucasa interfaces. One of the big things that causes Home Assistant to be so popular is the automation part of it. And so what Home Assistant has done in this release is updated the automation interface and it has a really good, neat UI, which I'll show you here in just a moment. Moving on down the list here, you can see that Paul uh, Botine joins Nabucasa. He's the developer of the mushroom cards and I have a video on the mushroom cards if you haven't seen that. And he also has done things like the icon picker on the front end, which allows you to choose which icon you, you can put against certain entities. So let's talk about streamlining automation. And what the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna show you how it used to look in an automation and then show you how it looks today. So if we go over to how it used to look, I'm gonna create a quick little automation by clicking the button here. And it's just gonna be a blank automation. And first of all, you can see that there's a lot of whites or a lot of space in between these selections and they're all expanded out all together all the time. So let's just give it a name, demo automation. And for this one, I'm going to use a trigger of a state. And just to be simple today, I'm gonna to use the sun as a state or as an entity. And then you have your optional attributes, which it gives you a list of. And then you have your from and your to. Now, if you don't know what the sun goes from or what states the sun can be in, you're gonna to have to go look that up. That's one of the things the new automation is gonna fix for you. So let's say uh, below horizon, I believe is one of them. So I'm gonna say below horizon. And then I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna add an action. And that's going to be a call service action. Uh, switch turn on will be the action. And I want a light to come on. So I'll just choose an entity here and that will turn on the light. Now you can see that you have all this space here and everything is all in one big long line. If you wanna do conditions or triggers, it's all in here as well the names up here, the mode that operates in is all here as well. So let's just save that. And that's how you create an automation the old way. So creating an automation on this screen is the same. We start the same anyway, we create an automation and then we select an empty automation. The difference now is very obvious. You can see that everything is collapsed down and it's a very clean interface. So to start with, we're gonna add a trigger and I'm gonna again use state and the entity is gonna be sun because that's what we chose in the other one for comparison. And then you can choose the attributes, but look at what we have here under to and from. These are the states that are provided by this entity. No longer do you have to guess what the entity states are. You can just choose them. And I'll choose below horizon here. And when I'm done with that, I can just kind of collapse this out of the way. So the state or trigger is when sun changes to below horizon, I'm going to add an action. And my action is gonna be call service. And again, it's a very streamlined, very easy to use. It's especially nice on a mobile device. The service I'm gonna call is uh, switch turn on like I did before. And we're gonna choose an entity here, just like we did before. And we are done with that. Now the difference is you name it after the fact. So we're gonna call this a demo automation. You can give a description if you want, save it. And now we have this demo automation. Now, some things you might notice, well, first of all, you can see what this is doing very easily. When the sun changes to below horizon, I'm going to turn on the playroom lights. If you come over here, uh, I have to go through, okay, state, sun, entities, below horizon, come down here, call service switch, turn on. Now it's very simple to see what this automation is doing. Some things that are missing here are now over in this overflow menu. 
all of these things, including renaming them, changing the mode. If you want to change it to, uh, let's say you want to change it from single to uh, something else, you can do that here. You want to rename it, you can rename it here. If you want to edit in YAML, you click on that right there or go back to visual editor. And then you can get information on this, the history of it running, the settings, the name and all this stuff here, and anything that's related to it. And then we can come out of it, go back to the main display here. Now, some of the other things that have changed, if you look over here, you have these toggles for the automations, and then you have all of these actions over here. All of that is now over in the overflow menu. So if I want to disable that demo automation, I would click the overflow, click on disable, and now we have a disabled button here. If I wanna run it, I click this. If I wanna look at traces, I look at that. And of course I don't have any traces because it hasn't run yet. And then you can delete it or duplicate it as well, straight from this overflow menu. So that is automations in a, a streamlined fashion. Really nice and really fun to use because it's very simple and makes it a lot easier to, to do things in there. And you can see some of the other examples that they put on here uh, in the blog post. Next up are new helpers, the weekly schedule. So you can run scheduled based automation for the same type e or same time each week or each day. So let's go look at how that works. We go into helpers and we do a weekly helper. Just change, uh, choose schedule down here from the drop down, And you might've seen it, but the create helper button is over here. Uh, create schedule. And then you can just drag whatever you want here for times of days. And just put stuff on the calendar. Now, every time this particular helper is active, you can schedule automations against it and do other things with it. We'll give it a demo helper. Create that. And now you can do things like look at what that uh, demo helper is doing under info. You can look at the history. So it's all it's on right now because it's scheduled. Uh, you can look at the settings. So you can come in here and change these around. You can move these all over the place if you want to once you get them. You can get rid of them by clicking on them. You can add them, move them. Just a really neat way, a neat interface to be able to add a a helper to automatically reschedule recurring events on days of the week and certain times of the day. So that's really neat. All right, Bluetooth everywhere. This is a big one, not something I'm gonna demonstrate in this video, but in a future video, I will. In the last release, you might remember that Bluetooth integration was released. Um, now, not only do they support multiple Bluetooth adapters, you support ESP home devices using, uh, using them as a Bluetooth proxy. So now you can expand the breach of your Bluetooth from your home assistant using ordinary ESP32 devices. And there are some devices out there. Uh, this is the Bluetooth proxy that you can set. You can put this in any of your ESP devices and turn them into a Bluetooth proxy. It needs to be an e ESP32 device. Some of the ESPs don't have Bluetooth on them. So it has to have a Bluetooth. And now right now this is only passive. Um, you can't do any active Bluetooth with it, but you are going, they are going to be adding that in the future. You can go to the installer website and this uh, is where you can add that code directly to your devices. You can use a generic ESP32. You can use this MS stack device uh, and some of these other devices. It does not work on uh, the C, where does it say here? It does not work on the ESP32 C3. It must be a plain ESP32. So if you got just a little ESP32 BLE boards, that'll work for you. You just pick your product, turn it into a Bluetooth proxy, no programming or other software needed. And then whatever comes into range passively to that Bluetooth proxy will then work in Home Assistant. What this is great for is if you have your if you have your devices or uh, your Bluetooth or home assistant device way back in a closet somewhere and you have devices throughout your house that you need to pick up Bluetooth on, now you can do that by placing these proxies in strategic locations around your house and be able to use home assistant still uh, in the Bluetooth capacity. So that's really, really fancy. Um, that's a really big release for this. Uh, let's see what else is on here. 
Most, my, most integrations now support using the adapter with the best signal to connect devices that need an active connection. Extension cables, USB, Ethernet extenders, or USB IP coupled with an additional Bluetooth adapter can significantly extend your active connection range. Uh, besides nine new supported brands, there's also support for a new open standard BT Home. It's automatically discovered by Home Assistant. Devices can run over a year on a single battery and it supports data encryption. And this is what it is. BT Home is an open standard for broadcasting sensor data over Bluetooth LE. It's energy effective and flexible for devices to broadcast their sensor data. And again, it can run over a, a year on a single battery, allows data encryption, it's supported by popular home systems like Home Assistant. So projects using that right now, of course, are Home Assistant, the ATC Me Thermometer, which I have a number of these around the house. B Parasite is a soil and moisture ambient temperature thingy. Uh, thingy is a scientific term. Example data is what comes in. Uh, and then all of this specific stuff that talks about how it works uh, in detail. And you can read through all of that if you want to. So that is really neat that we now support in Home Assistant or Home Assistant supports the open standard, the BT Home open standard. Um, and then finally, if you are using Home Assistant operating system, they recommend version nine or later when released. It comes with a faster D-Bus broker and newer Bluetooth firmware, which can significantly enhance the whole Bluetooth performance experience. All right, so there's that. And Z-Wave firmware updates are now live. In 2022.7, there was support for updating Z-Wave device firmware, but you had to actually download that stuff and store it and then update it. So Alcazone was not satisfied with that approach. It worked on a better solution, which is what it, there is today. It's the introduction of Z-Wave JS firmware update service for supported manufacturers. Remember that it can now automatically detect, download and install a firmware update if it is available for your device. Right now, only Jasco products are supported. Nabucasa has been talking with other manufacturers to get more of those devices into this auto update set up for Home Assistant. For those of you using Zigbee, it now supports network backups and migrating Zigbee coordinators between Zigbee coordinators. So backups are taken automatically. Uh, they can also be manually taken. And then after restoring Home Assistant, you can reconfigure ZHA and migrate to a new Zigbee coordinator without any loss of your settings or devices that were connected. So you also have this migration radio button here. So What's the purpose? It's helpful if your current radio fails or a new radio comes out and you may wanna to migrate to that radio. So you can see that all right here. Um, cool thing about processor and hardware, you can now check live statistics of your memory processor usage, memory or processor usage, when you load the hardware page in your system menu. This is the entire Home Assistant instance talking about how your hardware is handling the day-to-day -day tasks. It does not show any history. It will display five minutes of live data once you load the page. So let's go over there and take a look at the settings page uh, or the hardware page. So if we go over here to hardware, we'll just navigate over to that. So it takes a second to load up here, but you do see that my processor is at 37% and my memory is at under 31%. And again, this is uh, real time. It does not actually store uh, historical data for you now. There are a number of ways to get that, of course. You can you can store the system information in the database and pull it up in Grafana or statistics charts or something like that. But this is kind of neat to give you a quick indication of how much your hardware is being utilized by your Home Assistant instance. Uh, some other noteworthy changes. Um, more info dialog, merge with entity settings. Um, let's see if there's anything big here. Many more Bluetooth adapters are now supported. We talked about that a minute ago. Uh, let's see new integrations, blue maestro BT home. We talked about Ecowit is nice. Ecowit, uh, is now a, um, a native integration in home assistant. That is one I use for my weather station to pull data from my weather station. I use that uh, little GW1000 device. So it's nice to see this is now a supported, fully integrated integration with Home Assistant. 
Fully Kiosk Browser is now fully integrated, uh, natively integrated, I should say. And then we have all of these others that are going on here. We talked about schedule, which gives you a weekly schedule, and then all the rest of these right here. One of the things that I use all the time is pushover, and this is now uh, able to be configured via the UI rather than through um, YAML. So I can take my YAML configuration out and now just use the UI to configure my pushover instance. All right, so breaking changes. Always, always, always read the breaking changes before you do an update. It could be bad things. All right, so I guess the International Space Station, you can never know. Now you'll never, you'll not be able to know if it's above you nor the timestamp for the next rise. That's interesting. I wonder why that happened. Uh, MQTT, they've removed support for climate hold and away modes. It's now just called preset mode. Um, and then I use Roku's. It will indicate idle instead of home, which I like anyway. My charts actually actually show me when it's idle instead of saying home. Right now it sits on the home screen all the time for these Roku devices instead of being idle. And then for Z-Wave, you must be using Z-Wave JS Server 1.22.1 or greater. Uh, you'll need to update your server instance uh, or the JS add-on or the JS to MQTT add-on. Make sure those are all the latest for this version or things might not go as planned. All right, so that is a quick wrap up of what is going on in Home Assistant 2022.9. If you have any questions, leave those in the comment down below. You can also talk to me on Discord. Thank you for watching. If you wanna support what I do here, feel free to join the channel or just hit that thanks button down below and we will see you on the next video.